Yeah, and it, Johnny really has no need for introduction, but I like to do it anyways. Um, we have a number of really blessed um, and skilled and anointed teachers here among us, and that's one of the thing that one of the things that actually really sticks out to Johnny, uh, to me, that she studies the Word of God and she has a heart to see it communicated accurately, so that it brings transformation in our hearts and in our lives. And she is a part of our teaching team, uh, which we work together on a normal basis to help each other just to grow in communication and teaching. And she gets to bring the Word of God this morning. And so I'm just going to pray over her and send her forth to release the Word of God. So, Father, we come this morning with great expectation that we are going to grow from hearing your word this morning. Holy Spirit, we invite you to teach us. Lord, would you freshly anoint Johnny as she communicates and teaches us the Bible today. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Oh, man. <laughs> well... If you don't know me by now, I'm Johnny, and I do lead a Bible study on Tuesday mornings. We meet here at 10 a.m. in the prayer room. We would love to see you. Um, Pastor Ben has graciously given me permission to participate in presenting part of the book of Mark to you. And he has a way about himself where he has a tendency to stretch you just as far as he can get you. So I want, I think I want to thank him for allowing me to do that, but I'm still not real, real sure. Okay. Before we get into today's study, let's pray. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us your word, that you've given us your vision that we might be Bereans, that we might seek out what you have for us that you might bring us your wisdom and your knowledge in all the ways that you want us to follow you and in identifying yourself to us, Lord. And so bless this time this morning as we have to just speak your word. Bless you, Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> I have chosen Leave the Crowd and Become a Disciple for the title of our passage today. So let's read um, Mark 3, starting with verse 7, going through verse 19. But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach, and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of uh, Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanginese, that is, son of thunder. Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphineas, Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And they went into a house. In our study of chapter 3 so far, we saw last week that Jesus had healed a man's withered hand in the synagogue on Sabbath, no less. And so the Pharisees became quite angry about all of this, and they sought how they might kill Jesus. And so they went into like a um, 
I guess, a bondage with the Herodians who they had never liked. In fact, they you know, totally disliked him and didn't have anything to do with him. But they wanted to put him down, and so they, they needed some help with that. As a result of this, Jesus and his disciples have left the area, not because they fear those who are against them, but because at this time Jesus must just fulfill his mission. In reviewing this passage that I just read to you, um, there are two things that I want us to consider. There are two groups of people. There's the crowd, and then there are the disciples who went to be, or traveled with Jesus, actually. So um, if we look at this crowd, we, we could just pass over it. But I, I really wanted, as Ben said, I really wanted to seek this out. And what, why are you telling me this? Why are you telling me about this crowd why are you comparing the disciples with the crowd? What is Jesus doing here? Why is he doing this? And so I have looked at this um, in quite a few different ways. If we considered the crowd, we see that they came from every single direction. Uh, they came from all over. And we need to understand that the time that it takes us to travel for 5 to 80 miles, it doesn't take us, you know, and I, some of us drive so well that we could get anywhere in 80 hours, in, I mean 80 <laughs> miles in an hour. <laughs> but in the case of, of, of the, this time, during Jesus' time, it took a little bit longer than that. A two or three hour walk for some of these people would take, for us, would take, I mean a drive for us would have taken three to four days. Even though Israel is a small country, it's approximately 290 miles from the northern tip to the southern tip and 85 miles east to west on the shortest area there. So some of the people were probably coming from approximately 5 to 80 miles away. Following the crowd, following Jesus, the crowds were curious. Why was he here? What was he doing? What was his point? Was everything they had heard true? Was he, gonna, was he their Messiah? But they knew for a fact that he was healing, and so they were curious. And this crowd, it tells us in the word that there were, they were a multitude. Another translation says they were many, and, you know, many is many, so we know there was a crowd. So uh, <laughs> this caused a lot of problems. When you consider back to the Romans ruling in Israel during this time, they were concerned. Um, the Pharisees were actually uh, more concerned than the people because they were just wanting to see who Jesus was. But this caused problems because the Pharisees were concerned that the Romans um, were fearful of an insurrection. And so this again caused a problem and caused the Pharisees to become quite angry. Um, we also see that Jesus asked for a small boat in case he needed it because the crowds were crushing him. Have you ever been in a crowd turning angry or not getting what they want? A great number of years ago, probably 40 years ago, I made a trip to back home to Virginia and coming back across country to Idaho, we missed our connections. And so we had to spend the night in a hotel. In those days, you know, the airlines would put you up in a hotel. They don't do that anymore. But we, we had, we, they, they were the cause of us missing our connection, so they put us up in a hotel. In the early hours of the morning, the fire alarm went off. Now, just the month before that, there had been a huge fire in Mexico, and many people were killed. So nobody was stopping to say, well, I wonder, was that really a fire alarm? No, wait, you could hear doors opening before I could get the kids out of bed and in their shoes. People were running down the hall to get out of this hotel. And of course, my mind is going, oh my goodness, I've got to get these two boys, seven and nine years old, down those steps. And I became sort of fearful. And so I said, I just shot up a prayer as I'm pushing the kids out the door. Jesus, help us, help us. So we're in the hall. It's very crowded. Everybody's pushing, shoving. Uh, people are just shouting and cussing, actually, you know, because they wanted people to move faster. 
And as I see that we're going to be pushed down into having to go through that door on the stairwell to the outside, I mean, it was, it was terrifying because I didn't, real, I didn't understand how I'm going to get these boys downstairs without somebody pushing them down. So, again, I'm praying, Jesus, help us. So we get to the doorway, and just as I'm trying to settle the kids around me, the biggest, I mean, biggest man you've ever seen came up beside of me, swooped up both of my boys, threw them under his arms, and down the steps he went. I was so relieved. I was so relieved. Oh, man, it was something. So I'm looking, trying to see where everybody's going. And finally, I was outside, and the boys ran toward me. And we're standing there shivering because it's winter. And we're wondering, okay, what's going on? What's going to happen? Well, the fire marshal actually came on over this big megaphone and said, it's okay, folks. You can go back in the hotel. Everything's all right. Nobody moved. It was like, you, you, you don't think I'm going back in there. Uh-uh, no way. So he realized, you know, we were all standing there. We're not moving. And so he, I guess he decided, well, I better tell him what went on. So what happened, they had a new employee that came in that morning, and he turned all the ovens on too high, and it set off the fire alarm. So, <laughs> so I had requested help. And Jesus had answered me. You know, I think we forget sometimes that Jesus was actually, is, was at that time, human. He was a human. He was a man. And he could see that the crowd was pressing in on him. And so he did request this boat to have. The crowd in our reading saw Jesus again as a means to an end. They came to get what they wanted from him. Have you ever stopped to think that we do the same thing today? Hmm. We come to Jesus for all kinds of reasons instead of just coming to him and committing to Jesus. Neither the size or the intensity of this crowd indicated commitment. Most people were there to get help for healing, for exorcisms, for words of comfort but they didn't know who Jesus really was, only that he responded to their needs. But let's look at verse 10 and 12 again. 10 through 12. For he healed many so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him, and the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out, saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. So he forbade them to tell anyone who he actually was. It's very clear that he did not want to have or to be acknowledged by the demonic world. Was it because the unclean spirits are also lying spirits? And he didn't want them to reinforce the misconception of him being the military leader who would free them from Rome. Also, it has been stated in other places that the time for this revelation of who he truly was had not come. Or as Pastor Ben said several weeks ago, the release date was not at this particular time. The Gospels remind us that Jesus definitely could have instigated a political revolution. His speech was clear-cut, distinct, and compelling and he verbally overwhelmed his opponents. Obviously, Jesus was quite popular with a certain sect of people, but it's equally obvious that his popularity both impressed and worried the Pharisees. But Jesus didn't really seem concerned. I'm not sure that we really appreciate the enormity of Jesus' temptation during this time. I'm not sure that anybody's even suggested this but I've been sort of mulling it over, so I'm going to throw it out to you. Uh, to give the people what they wanted at this particular time, um, we, we just can't fathom exactly what was going on 2,000 years later, but Mark's readers understood it better than we do. 
that for Jesus to withstand temptation and choose his way, choose his father's way, was a significant moral and spiritual decision. I, I just found that really interesting as I thought about that. Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. More and more people are hearing about Jesus, and yet he withdraws when they begin to follow him. Possibly it was at the leading of his father. Verse 13 is interesting here. And he went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted. He called the ones he wanted, and the scripture tells us that they came to him. Who did the choosing here? Jesus. John 15, 16 says that you have not chosen me. I have chosen you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Jesus never leaves us or forsakes us. He doesn't turn his back on us. We had the crowd, and now we are going to look at the disciples. Why did he choose 12? This was another thing. I just mulled this around and around in my head. And I wondered if it was possibly that it corresponded to the 12, 12 tribes of Israel, showing the new covenant that we have based on Jesus' teaching of faith and love. Jesus' choosing of the 12 was puzzling because the men he chose were quite average. There was Simon, whose name means shifting sand, and was given a new name, which means rock. There was James and John, called sons of thunder. What tempers they had. Did you read it in Luke 9? Let's call down fire and destroy this city. We don't like what's going on here. Or Mark 9. Those guys aren't part of our group, Lord, but they're preaching in your name. Let's forbid them. Well, hopefully, we wouldn't want these guys that wanted to blow people away or burn people up if our message was peace, grace, and love. <laughs> then there's Matthew, a tax collector. Now, I'm here to ask you, would you want the IRS trailing you around all day? I don't know. And Thomas, who doubted Jesus was alive after his resurrection. Or Simon, the zealot, who wanted to overthrow the Roman government. Simon and his brother, Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, fishermen. Smelly fishermen? <laughs> Such persons could hardly be described as spiritual heavyweights. The rest were nothing to brag about either. They were an unlikely and diverse group with not very much in common except for one thing, their loyalty to Jesus. He risked a lot in bringing together these 12 very ordinary men, each with his own agenda and concept of how a Messiah should behave. <clears throat> I see through this that these men that he chose, with the exception of one, would actually turn the world upside down. Why? How do you suppose these common men would be able to spread the gospel as far as they did? Was it because they had been intimate with Jesus and had had true relationship, true friendship with him? And then they had been filled with the Holy Spirit after his resurrection. I see that this means when Jesus chose you and me, that he knew that we too would be changed, not because of who we are, but because his spirit would dwell in us. Amen. That doesn't mean that our choices are always good or the right ones, no. Sometimes we make terrible mistakes. We live in a fallen world, and sometimes it clings to us. But when we turn and embrace his love, his mercy and his love and grace flows unabated. We can often tell when people have been with Jesus. In Acts 4.13, Peter and John were put in jail preaching. It says that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, that they were astonished 
and they took note of those men and where they had been with Jesus. I understand that those who are committed to Jesus are always first given to being with Jesus. Psalms 27, 4 says, One thing I ask of the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. In verses 14 through 19 of Mark 3, Jesus sends the twelve out to preach and to have power to heal sickness and to cast out demons. He's not going with them. But in Matthew chapter 10, we get a little more explanation of what he wants them to do. First, they are not to go into the way of the Gentiles or into the cities of the Samaritans. Now, of course, this does not apply to us. Our commission today is found in Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Secondly, they are to go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. When they preach, they are to say the kingdom of heaven is at hand. These men had heard this before. So now Jesus is telling them to go do it. How could it be at hand? The kingdom of God is at hand. I think it was at the hand and the person of the king in their midst. It has also been said that we, the church, are not to build the kingdom. Jesus Christ will establish his kingdom when he returns to the earth. But we have his kingdom in us, and we should still be spreading the news of this kingdom. And lastly, they were to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demo devils. They are sent out with the very same credentials that Jesus had himself. So that got me thinking, what is a disciple anyway? In our context, it is simply one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrines of Jesus Christ. A stronger word would be a convinced adherent of an individual as in a follower of Jesus. Discipleship has and ha had and has today its own agenda. Being a disciple of Jesus means more than just hanging on and having one's needs met. It means commitment. It means obedience. It means loyalty. And those would be great challenges to meet because Jesus was getting deeper and deeper into trouble every day. He'd already been branded a heretic and a sinner. And we may also find ourselves being branded as well if we truly stand strong for the Lord. Jesus and those who closely follow him march to the tune of a different drummer. His will is centered in God's will, as ours should be. And according to the usual worldly standard of behavior, we all seem unbalanced, even to friends and some family. John 6, 66 says that from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus answered the twelve. Simon Peter, or he asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him. Lord, whom shall we go? To whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. So in previewing all of these verses in Mark chapter 3, I came to the conclusion that we can start as one of the crowd, but we cannot stay as one of the crowd. We will either turn back when things get tough, and stop hearing Jesus, or we will submit to the Lordship of Jesus. Being a disciple also calls for discipline. In rereading one of A.W. Tozer's books, he gives us six rules for daily following the Lord. There is the discipline of shunning the world. We must not forget the world around us is in conflict with the word within us. There is discipline of meditating on God's word. The word leads us straight to the heart and the mind of God. There's a discipline of solitude. 
Psalms 46.10 says, Be still and know that I am God. There's a discipline of daily expectation of God's presence. I love Jeremiah 29.13 that says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. There's the discipline of reverential awe or fear. Now, a lot of people in our day today in the churches, they don't think that we should fear God. And that is a completely total, I mean, a big, big sermon. I, I could go on, but anyway. Reverential fear is simply because of who he is. Simply because of who he is. And there's the discipline of obedience. There is a once-for-all factor in the Christian life. Our salvation is a once-for-all experience, but there's also a daily renewing of our walk with God. Proverbs 2.5 says, Fear the Lord, and you will have knowledge of God. Knowledge, in Vine's complete expository dictionary, says the word implies to have an intimate experience or knowledge of him. This is what is promised to us. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowing God intimately. We must never alter God's nature to suit our own. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 4, Paul is very concerned and says, I am jealous for you with godly jealousy, for you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus. This is really scary to me that we can actually believe in Jesus, we can make that commitment to him, and yet not actually know him. You know, I could look around and I could pick someone in this room, and I'm gonna pick on my sister, Teresa. She came to visit me, not knowing I was gonna be up here today, so she, she's been with me almost two weeks. But I, I could say to you, I want you to meet my sister, I wanna introduce you to her. And if you were a teacher or a, a principal in a school, I, I might also add, oh, she was a principal too. You guys have a lot in common, right? But you would never really know her if you didn't spend time with her. Um, you wouldn't know what her dislikes were. You wouldn't know what she really liked. And you wouldn't know what she does almost every single solitary day when she's at home. Not that she's been with me. But I'm not, and I'm not going to tell you. But anyway, <laughs> you have to get to know the person. You have to spend time with them. And you have to interact with them. I found this um, scripture that just kept coming back to me the whole time I was preparing this. Mark 7, 23, Jesus says, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The Greek translation, and I had to look this up because I had not, I'd never seen, never attached myself to this quite so strong. The Greek translation for new is the Hebrew word yada. Y-A-D-A. -A. It means I never knew you intimately, as in Genesis 4.1. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. Jesus says, I never knew you intimately. Here are some questions that I wonder if many of us have thought of for ourselves. Have I come away from the crowd and submitted to Jesus? Am I doing the work of the Lord? Am I surrendered to the purposes of God? Do I carry the hope in my heart? 2 Corinthians 4.16 says, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet our inward man is being renewed day by day. Our inner man 
being renewed day by day. Hebrew 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I can arrive at a very good conclusion about all of this. If there's no hope for the future, there'll be no faith to face it, let alone to do it. So even in our wild world that we're all seeing today, we, we must hold on to hope. We must hold on to what it is that Jesus has prepared for us. In Luke 19, 13, we're told to occupy until he comes. Excuse me. The Greek word, too long for me to pronounce, pregnant my sister, is to occupy, is to have a practical approach to problems and affairs, or to take, oops, I lost my place, or to take care of business. Keep on doing what we're doing. Okay? <laughs> oh, me. And so today, as we think of following Jesus and becoming all that he has destined for us, let us place him first in our lives. Let us commit wholeheartedly, being obedient and loyal to our Lord Jesus. Lori, could I have the worship team back up, please? I'm reminded of the story of King Rehoboam in 2 Chronicles chapter 12. It says that he reigned for 17 years in Jerusalem, being the son of Solomon. But he did evil because he did not prepare his heart to seek the Lord. So my last question for us to consider today is have we prepared our hearts to seek the Lord so that we might follow him and his direction, being totally committed to doing his bidding. To me, that's a disciple. That's a disciple. Let's pray. We thank you, Father, that your son Jesus spoke in the world and prayed that his own joy might be fulfilled in us. May his joy overflow in our lives that he might keep us from stumbling. Raise us up in your secret place, Lord, Teach us all that you desire for us and our families. And please give us the boldness to perform all your direction in obedience completely, immediately. Jesus, we thank you and we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, we pray. We have a time after church for prayer. We have a time for those people that would like to commit their lives to Jesus. We have time for those that want to commit even deeper than where you are right now. And so could the prayer team come up, please? Or do we have a prayer team? I think, well, we got Pastor Ben, so that's good. Okay. Did anyone get give a word today or have something they wanted to share? Okay, go ahead. We just like to have an opportunity that as we worship, we expect that we're going to hear God's voice through his scripture. But as we're in relationship with God, we also like to listen. If, if God's saying something that he wants to be spoken right here and right now, and these words are prayed through, they're weighed through, um, and Steve has something that is from the Lord. Praise God. Glory to God in the highest. Um, this word was given to me. Uh, I was at Papa Tom's on December 9th. 2006 is at 8 30 p.m that's what the time was and uh when you arise in the morning do you praise my name and give me the glory or do you wake up murmuring because of another day's work how do you want your day to turn out when you start your day praise the name of the lord by wishing me the lord your god good morning quote a psalm or another verse of praise with a joyful heart not as the hypocrites do, but with gladness in the secret and quiet of the morning. Then God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit will be invited into your daily routine and will thus thwart whatever plans the enemy may have had for you. And if trials and tribulations should challenge you, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. So when you get up every morning, give the day to me. Relax, let go, cease striving, and know that I am God and in control of your life. 
Amen. Amen. Well, would you guys stand with me? I just want to take some time and respond. Maybe it is that you're finding that God's calling you back into alignment in different portions of your life. Perhaps that is through, through aligning your heart, through giving. If you feel like you've been touched by the Lord or heard something from the Lord, or maybe you just need to respond via tithes and offerings, you're welcome to do that. We've got uh, baskets and boxes at the back of the room. We're also going to sing one more song together, so maybe it is that we just need to take a time of responding via listening into these words and declaring ourselves as followers of Jesus, that we're coming away from the crowd and we're stepping into discipleship. Or maybe it is that we need prayer for something. We just have an expectation that God still heals, Amen. that God still moves in great powers and signs, wonders, and miracles, and we're going to pray in faith and an expectation that he wants to move in your life. If you are all done for this morning, we've got some cookies and some coffee in this room next door. We'd love to connect with you. But for those of us who feel like we want to respond, we're going to have another song of response right here and right now. Worship team.